Good morning. This is London. British resistance at Singapore is stiffening. An authoritative London commentator said a few minutes ago that the British are counterattacking and that their counterattacks are meeting with some measure of success. It is reasonable to say, said this authoritative source, that the situation is certainly no worse and there are indications that it's better. The British are counterattacking toward their original line from which they withdrew day before yesterday. Today, we gather to remember a chapter in history that exemplifies courage, sacrifice, and resilience. This pivotal engagement, etched in the annals of World War II, stands not only as a testament to the valor of the soldiers involved, but also as a symbol of the indomitable spirit of the human soul in the face of adversity. As we gather around this miniature battlefield, I'm honored to introduce to you a chapter of history that resonates deeply with the spirit of strategy, valor, and camaraderie, the Battle of Bukit Chandu. On the shores of Singapore, amidst the lush greenery of Bukit Chandu, a small but determined force stood against the tide of advancing Japanese troops in February 1942. These brave men were none other than the soldiers of the Malay Regiment who, despite being outnumbered and outgunned, displayed unparalleled bravery and fortitude in the defense of their homeland. This afternoon, our very own Zul will be playing as the legendary Lieutenant Adnan Ben Saidi, who, as commander of the Malay Regiment Sea Company, famously made a last stand with his men along the ridge of Pasapanjang on the slopes of the hill that gives today's battle its name. Alongside Zul, Nabil will be representing Captain J.C. Johnson of the 2nd Loyals, who also fought bravely on that day, suffering heavy losses whilst defending the slopes of Pasir Panjani. Their valorous stand on the slopes of Bukit Chandu, their unwavering resolve in the face of overwhelming odds, continues to serve as a beacon of inspiration for generations to come. They fought not just for a patch of land, but for the ideals of liberty, justice, and sovereignty. As we reflect on the sacrifices made on that fateful day, let us also remember the countless lives lost on both sides, the families that were torn apart, and the scars that still linger in the collective memories of many nations. Amidst the chaos of war, let us not forget the bravery and commitment of the Japanese soldiers who fought with equal fervor on that same day. Their courage and their determination, though on the opposing side, are also a testament to the complexities of war and the human experience. Representing the Japanese soldiers today uh, is uh, the commander, uh, Jared. Uh, he'll be representing the commander of the Japanese 56th Infantry Regiment, along with Eugene Lim, uh, Case and Grace, and uh, also Alfred. And they are gonna be uh, Jared's subordinates. I hope you guys have a lot of fun but also spend time reflecting on what happened many years ago. <coughs> if you're visiting Singapore, the battlefield of Bukit Chandu is located along Kent Ridge in the west of Singapore, not too far a walk from the Pasir Panjang MRT station, uh, which is found on the yellow line. Today, Kent Ridge is lush and covered with trees. And you'd be forgiven for thinking you were out in the middle of the jungle. However, back in 1942, this ridge was mostly void of trees, as can be seen uh, by this aerial photograph taken by the Royal Air Force in 1941. That narrow, long rectangular building along the right bottom edge of the photo uh, was the Opium Factory, which gave its name to the hill uh, that the snake-like Peppers Road leads up to. Bukit Chandu uh, is Malay for Opium Hill. Uh, the reflections of Bukit Chandu War Museum is now situated uh, in that house that is on top of Bukit Chandu. If you look carefully at the photograph, um, the ridge mostly fills the bottom half of the photo, and as you can see, uh, there's very little vegetation. I invited the two British players, Nabil and Zul, 
to deploy their uh, platoons along the ridge uh, whilst the Japanese players waited outside and uh, did some scheming of their own. Um, once uh, Nabil and Zul had deployed their troops, uh, mostly dug in uh, in slit trenches as represented by those tongue depressors, and uh, once, uh, once they had deployed, um, I covered their deployment with pieces of paper uh, behind uh, bits of card and whatnot, so that when the Japanese players came in, um, they couldn't see what was before them. While Nabil and Zul were deploying, I met with my team of players in the neighbouring room where we decided on a plan. I decided to concentrate the majority of our troops and half our tanks on Nabil and Zul's left flank, aiming to capture Bukit Chandu Hill and the valley next to it. This force would be commanded by Case and myself. Meanwhile, Eugene Lim would take the other half of our tanks to mount an assault on the enemy's right flank. The plan was to swiftly move in our tanks towards the opium factory and create panic among the enemy lines, forcing them to move their troops towards their right and weaken their left, making it easier for our main force to attack. When we arrived to deploy, we were surprised to see the British deployment zones hidden. This made things more troublesome because we were unable to determine the exact locations of our objectives and how Nadil and Zhu had distributed their forces. Nevertheless, we went ahead with our plan. Historically, the Japanese had attempted to infiltrate the British lines by dressing a regiment in captured Punjabi uniforms. And as you can see on the table, Grace's entire command consists of Punjabi figurines. I prevented the British from firing upon Grace's platoon until they had spotted or identified the treachery by ranging in as per ranging in with mortars. Grace, on the other hand, was not permitted to do anything but march her, her platoon forward, four abreast as the Japanese did historically, uh, directly towards uh, the objective set by her commander, which was the gap between the two hills. As Grace's platoon approached the British lines, uh, Zul managed to range in or to spot the treachery, and as happened historically, uh, the Japanese took heavy casualties. However, Grace was able to change history, uh, and instead of her her platoon breaking and fleeing from the table, uh, her Punjabis actually managed to banzai into the British forces and uh, force them out of their slip trenches and thereby gaining a valuable geographical position for Jared's advancing army. Alfred and I were tasked with pushing hard against the loyal regiment to make life difficult for Nabil forces and to pin him in place. The enemy Hago advanced steadfastly in support of its comrades up the ridge. Unbeknownst to the crew, the Loyal's only anti-tank rifle team was lurking in the vegetation, waiting to ambush any Japanese armor unlucky enough to find itself in their sights. As the tank advanced further, the anti-tank team sprung into action. Both the gunner and loader burst forward from their prepared positions and fired at the tank from almost point-blank range. Right, so I moved out my boys anti-tank rifle team to try and take out that Hago over there. Uh leading up four to hit. Let's see what happens. It hits! It hits! Around slammed into the armor, but bounced off it seemingly without causing any damage. The tank lurched forward, but suddenly ground to a halt, its machine guns falling silent. For good measure, the team loaded another round and fired at the tank. Again another ricochet, again the tank remained as it was, motionless. Little did the anti-tank team know that their actions brought the Loyals time to reconsolidate their positions to better fend off the Japanese infantry assault. 
the Japanese tank crew in the Hago, injured from the spoiling of the tank's armor as a result of the rounds hitting the vehicle, would be unable to carry the fight for some time yet. With our Hargo stunned by the boys' AT team, Eugene and I call forward our infantry to charge forward to cover the Hargo. Our infantry caught the enemy outside some outhouses, and with hand-to-hand -hand fighting happening, our infantry carried the day to breach the enemy flank. What you may have noticed is that some of the British units have one or two uh, silver tokens with them. That's because during turn two, I called Zhu and Nabil aside and privately told them that from turn two onwards, each of their units would only be permitted two rounds of fire. This made the defense uh, a lot more challenging for the British players. Furthermore, um, I allow the Japanese an air attack during the game and uh, at one point uh, this caused uh, severe damage to the center of the British defense, uh, taking out a um, universal carrier and uh, one other squad. Also, historically, the Japanese bombs had struck the uh, oil reserves and this uh, uh, resulted in large bellows of black uh, smoke from the burning oil and this also played a role in our game. Upon seeing the enemy positions on Bukit Chandu Hill I decided that we would try to take our main force and capture Lieutenant Adnan and wipe out the forces there. We began with a bombardment with our light tanks and field artillery to soften up the defenders to make it easier for our troops to assault the hill. In addition, there was the presence of smoke from nearby burning oil tanks off the battlefield that created some problems for my main force. Sometimes the smoke from the oil tanks would cover up infantry formations which would prevent them from firing on the enemy positions. Uh, but this also meant that the enemy could not fire on us as well as they couldn't see us. So we pushed in our infantry to try and take the hill. It took us several turns to be able to overrun the defenders on the hill, but eventually we were able to surround Lieutenant Adnan and capture him. My brave squad kept the Japanese advance at bay. But with my ammunition running out, the Japanese infantry were able to get amongst my boys and, my, and our position were finally overrun. With Adnan captured, my squad overwhelmed by the weight of the Japanese forces, Hill 228 fell. We've come to the end of the game. Uh, that objective over there was contested by the mortar and the Japanese, so no one got the points for that objective. No one took that objective over there, so that's a zero point for both sides. Adnan was captured, but it wasn't enough to secure a victory for the Japanese, which means the British won. The British won! Yes. Yes. We, we lost 90% of our troops. <laughs> we lost! We won! Well done, Oh, well done, guys. <laughs>So I'm here with uh, Tang Tang, uh, the curator of the battle box, and we're um, on the battlefield of uh, Pasir Panjang, right? Mm. So um, I, I was wondering, why are you so incredibly passionate about preserving the past? Uh, I think uh, growing up in the old family, I have heard a lot of stories, yeah. and of course, 
my generation, the childhood, uh, we don't have to, um, we don't have a lot of uh, social media or gadgets. So it's a lot of reading and a lot of imagination. Right. So I think the imagination got the better of me. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, yeah, so I think that, um, and I always thought that it would be very nice to be able to see the past again yeah. somehow. And so I design it like a time travel, you know, uh, if I were to do any exhibition yeah. about the past, I want it to be experiential and people can for a moment forget that they're in the present and they've gone back to the past. Yeah. It's one of the uh, more effective way of, of conveying a message or even um, teaching uh, some lessons from the past. All right, that's, that's really interesting. This particular place is known for uh, where the Malay Regiment made a famous last stand. And Lieutenant uh, Adnan, um, legend has it that he was massacred or he was uh, executed here by the Japanese. Uh, what do you think this place, what value do you think this place has for the Malay people of Singapore and Malaysia? Ah, it's a very deep question. Yeah. Um, I think it's a sense of identity. Yeah. You know, uh, you know the boys, they were all born, uh, or they were recruited at Port Dixon. Right. And they fought all the way down. So, um, they think they were fighting for Malaya or for uh, a larger identity. I think it is, it's quite interesting because at that time, uh, people don't have a very clear-cut identity that so that's your place and that's my place. Right. But they're fighting a war, they're defending against a common enemy. Right. So they, they will be fighting up in Malaya and coming down here. And you've got Chinese who've gone all the way to Burma. And also, so so it is not um, very clear cut that uh, you have a, a, a certain national identity and you stick to that. It's important to uh, try to be truthful to history yeah. and find the information and present it to people to uh, decide for themselves. I really don't think that it should be based on any racial lines at all. That's what happened in the past. The best things we can do is to learn from the past. Yeah, yeah so I think it's very important that we as the Malay people remember this battle. Um, given that many of us are only Malay by name, we, we don't really remember much about our heritage and where we come from. And, you know, Malay is such an umbrella term for the different cultural groups that are in Singapore. Yeah. So, having something to point back towards, uh, uh, in, even in, in, and this is something within uh, recent memory, right. um, a battle which we can be proud of, a unit that has such, um, you know, is dripping with, with, with historical legacy, such traditions that we can we can learn, and then them, I uh, know, fighting here at uh, Pasifanjang Hill, you know, um, the kind of the last stand that it took, it really shows us the kind of values that we really treasure: loyalty, courage. You know, even even uh, in the face of such odds, you know, it is something that we can be proud of uh, as Malays, and I think this this is why we should we really remember this battle. Yeah. Nobody wins in war. Remember the Japanese boys, they were as much a victim as everybody else. Yeah. Right? They were drafted. There was a they, you may think that they were dedicated to the uh, uh, the emperor, but the truth is that there were people of their times and not all of them uh, willingly joined the military. And they came out here, they're still in their teenage, they came out here, they die here. So I think it's a very sad thing to happen and uh, yeah. you know, I hope uh, no families have to go through anything like this. I really appreciate you taking time out to, to, to share with us. Um, if you haven't been to the Battle Box yet in Singapore, it's a must visit. What Tang Tang has done there is remarkable. So this brings us to the end of our After Action Report and reflections on the Battle of Bukit Chandu. I just wanted to take a moment to give a big shout out and thank you to all the amazing people who helped us set up and play the game. Thank you to the club members of Fireteam Arias, whom you would have met during the After Action Report, for making the game fun and the success that it was. A special thank you to Zul, who helped with the research and setting up of the game. His work behind the scenes really helped bring our big game together. Thanks also go to Darren for arranging the room and to Elias CC for the use of their facilities. We were also pleased to have Case and Grace join us for the first time at the club and we look forward to many more games with them in the future. I'm also grateful to the reenactors of History Fort Singapore and to Tang Tang 
for our time together at Pasir Panjang. Then finally, to all of you for watching, please do continue to support the channel and help spread the awareness of our wonderful hobby. Until next time, happy gaming!